that I, for me, and that I thought might be helpful, would be to think about um, diagnosis uh, of autistic development. Because I think this is a really important departure point for these sorts of conversations. Certainly from my point of view, as somebody who's fundamentally a, a, a clinician and interested in sort of improving kind of clinical support for autistic and this was certainly, I think, the fact that first got me interested in this, in this whole area and made me realise that there was a kind of a, a gap in our knowledge, which is there's diagnostic bias against girls and women who are on the autism spectrum. Because autistic girls and women are less likely to get an autism assessment compared to autistic boys and men. Uh, if they do get their assessment, um, they receive it later, on average, than equivalent males. So it's much more common for autistic uh, girls to be diagnosed in adolescence or for people to only be diagnosed in, in, in adults. Uh, and interestingly, even when autistic girls and women do get an assessment, uh, they're less likely to actually come out of that assessment, even if they are autistic, with an autism diagnosis. Um, you know, so there's something about you know, our current diagnostic criteria that don't well capture very often uh, the kind of the, the characteristics, the experiences uh, of autistic girls and women. So this is a really <laughs> important problem, I think, that, that we need to get better at solving. It's an inequality that we need to uh, try and address. And we can think about this, this bias, or I call it this under of autistic girls and women, uh, as having two components. There's a bias against autistic girls and women actually sort of getting through the door, if you like, and getting into the assessment clinic. Uh, and then there's also a bias, even if they do get through the door and get, get, into, get an assessment, of their meeting criteria. Yeah, so it's a kind of double, a, a pair of barriers, I think, that we're trying to deal with here. And generally, uh, people have been thinking about this over the last 10, 15 years, trying to understand it. And this is how they've really approached it. They thought, what is it about the individual characteristics of autistic girls and women that could be playing into this diagnostic bias? And so really, this is this sort of field of research that's come to be known quite often as, as an interest in the female autism phenotype. Now that's a term that for various reasons I'm slightly sort of moving uh, away from, but the, but the basic idea is that there may well be a kind of gender specific tendency for, for the way in which autism presents that doesn't fit well with current stereotypes, conceptions about autism, which after all were largely developed and tested on all male or largely male samples. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to talk about there. I want to briefly um, you know, this is this nice picture from, from Tanya Marshall, who, who's a, a clinician who's very interested in this, in this idea. So I want to start off by doing a bit of a whistle-stop tour of some of the research findings in this area about gender differences on, on the autism spectrum, and then to focus a bit more on one particular area um, that, that I find particularly important, and which I think also fits a bit more with the theme of this conference of we're thinking about... Um, uh, in engaging with autism from the point of view of autistic experience, you know, from the inside <laughs> out. Um, so, before I do this, I just want to say, a sort of offer a, a, a caveat, which is, you know, I'm talking about gender differences uh, in autism, uh, but I'm not trying to do a whole kind of men are from Mars, women are from Venus bit. Uh, I really, do, I'm not saying, you know, all, all autistic women are like this and all autistic men are like this. You know, clearly that would be a gross and unhelpful oversimplification. I'm talking about tendencies, things that exist at the kind of group level averages, if you like. So I think one finding that, that is increasingly being sort of demonstrated in the literature, um, and uh, you know, Felicity Sedgwick's work is, is very, uh, you know, has done a, a heck of a lot for this, and, and also I think Rachel Hillers, um, is this notion that on average, autistic girls and women can be more sort of socially motivated, more um, oriented to uh, the social world than autistic boys and men. And also, if you like, more um, influenced by such things as, as, as social rejection and, and difficulties within in the social world. So that's, that's one finding that's coming out consistently uh, as an important gender on the autism spectrum. Another more tentative finding is not to do, if you like, with the nature of autistic experience and characteristics, but the timing. So what we're beginning to discover is that and again, this is the sort of thing, you know, you have to be tolerant with us academics, because it normally takes us about 10 years or 20 years to catch up with what many autistic people and clinicians already knew. Uh, but what we're starting to discover is that often the kind of, the point at which 
uh, difficulties associated with autism become overt, become um, so serious as to need clinical uh, intervention, is often later for girls than for boys. And in particular, adolescence is emerging as a really, really important moment in the life, particularly of autistic girls, as a moment where sometimes we see a sort of escalation uh, of the sorts of difficulties associated with being an autistic person in a largely non-autistic world. Uh, whereas for the boys, often those sorts of difficulties appear earlier. And again, you can see how that could feed into the, the late and the underdiagnosis of, of autistic girls and women. We know that in, in the kind of current cultural climate and other current systems of care, autistic people are at very uh, high risk of experiencing mental health difficulties at some point in their lives. And, and there seems to be something of a gender-specific pattern to, to these, in the same way that there, there is in, in the non-autistic. So, uh, certainly after adolescence, um, we see somewhat higher rates of anxiety and depression amongst autistic girls and women compared to autistic boys and men. Um, although I don't wish at all to downplay the fact that the rates of anxiety and depression are also very high in autistic <coughs> boys and men. And we tend to see, especially in, in a mid and early childhood, higher levels of um, you know, behavioural difficulties, so-called behaviours that challenge amongst autistic boys compared to autistic girls. And again, you could see how that feeds into the underdiagnosis of autistic girls. Um, you know, if you imagine you have um, an undiagnosed autistic boy uh, who uh, has behavioural difficulties, uh, perhaps is really <coughs> impacting upon um, lessons, uh, and is, is really on the teacher's radar, I mean, they're going to be thinking about this lab. They're going to be thinking about, okay, you know, what's going on here? Maybe he needs an autism assessment. If you compare that to perhaps a, a, an autistic girl, who doesn't have those sorts of behaviour difficulties, but is really anxious and is maybe sitting at the back of the class, um, hoping not to be noticed, hoping not to be called on to speak. Uh, she has difficulties that are really impacting upon her life, but they're much less evident to the people around her. And to put it bluntly, they're causing less problems to the people around her, and so they're much more likely to be overlooked and ignored. Okay, so that was a real kind of rapid... Uh, sort of tour of some of the evidence base on gender difference on the autism spectrum. I'm now going to go for a bit of a deeper dive into this topic of, of what many uh, researchers, and, and uh, I think many autistic people too, called uh, camouflaging, or social camouflaging, as a potential really important area of gender difference that also really can feed into this diagnostic bias against uh, girls and women. So what am I talking about with camouflaging? Well, uh, I thought this was a really nice uh, definition that, that actually ended up in the, pe the title of a paper by Laura Hull, whose PhD I'm supervising, uh, where she uh, did a qualitative study where she collected data from, from over 90 autistic uh, adults. And one of the questions was, you know, we call this social camouflaging, what do you call it? Uh, and one, one person said, I call it putting on my best normal. Uh, and you often hear this phrase that, that I think was, was coined by Leanne holiday Willie uh, in her very influential memoir of, of pretending to be normal, is this phrase you often hear a lot uh, in describing camouflage. So, you know, we've tended to break camouflage down into two bits, masking, which you come to as high uh, aspects of camouflage as opposed to hiding your autistic characteristics, perhaps even developing different personas or characters to use during social situations, and then compensation, which is more about the development of particular uh, skills and, and capacities to sort of navigate the, the world of, of non-autistic, neurotypical uh, social interaction. Um, so just to, to give some examples, and, and oh yeah, I just want to say before I get into this camouflaging bit, um, any sort of merit that you detect in what I'm about to say for the next five minutes is probably down to, to Laura Hull's work uh, in this area, who, who super, uh, PhD I'm supervising, who's done really, in my view, excellent work in this, and I'll be drawing on that today, including this study here, which you can download for free, it's, it's open access in chat, called Put It On My Desk. So, yeah, so an example of camouflaging, a, a really sort of simple example uh, from one young woman that I met in an eating disorders unit, was that she told me that when she was young, she really enjoyed a good stim, a stim and a flap, and it you know, helped her relax sometimes and manage her feelings and also express excitement and, and joy. Um, but what she noticed as she got into secondary school age was that the other kids would spot that and would sometimes make fun of her for, for flapping. And so she took a decision that she wasn't going to flap in public anymore. And she would just go home, she would wait till she got into her room, 
and she'd have a good, a good flap unobserved by, by her peers. So that's a simple example of, of what I'm talking about with, with marking. Um, there's a lot of uh, involved in camouflaging the sort of development of strategies for sort of non-autistic style, non-verbal behaviours. You know, so eye contact, you know, looking in between the eyes for three seconds and then looking away and, and, and learning gestures and facial expressions and so on. And there's also uh, quite often camouflaging in our experience, and, you know, again from our academic studies of this, and you're interested to hear people's own lived experience of this, that there's also quite a lot of mimicry and copying people. And I had, had an interesting insight into this the other day. And I went to a conference in um, Asia, in Singapore. And I came down to breakfast at our hotel. I think Damien can attest to this. It was a very, very confusing breakfast situation. There was kind of soup, dumplings, cornflakes. There was multiple different cues. It was just not clear at all what had to happen. So what did I do? I stood and I watched what the, the locals were doing, and then I copied them. You know, and so it gave, gave me an insight into you know, why that is such a powerful way of, 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 sort of what I was trying to do, really, which was to camouflage in that, in that situation. And also, often there's sort of if-then rules. You, know, you, you think of um, Oliver Sacks' description of Temple Grandin as an anthropologist on Mars. You know, the idea that many autistic people develop um, almost kind of social scientific... Uh, a systematic accounts of, of, of non-autistic social behaviour. And, you know, and, and perhaps some of you will have experience of this. For some people, uh, these can become very, very elaborate camouflage behaviours to the extent that almost a kind of persona gets developed that can be put on and used to survive and manage uh, certain situations. So, who camouflages? Well, um, Autistic people camouflage more than non-autistic people, although interestingly, non-autistic people do, do camouflage. Uh, you know, this is not just some sort of totally qualitatively distinct set of behaviours that, 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 that are only limited to autistic people. Uh, and interestingly, um, it's important to recognise that there's a lot of variability amongst autistic people in, in, in camouflaging. So this is a measure that we developed of camouflaging. Uh, and we gave it to a lot of people, I think it's sort of four or five hundred people, and scores down here indicate like low levels of camouflaging, scores up here indicate really high levels of camouflaging. And so you can see, you know, most of the autistic people in the sample are you know, doing quite a lot of camouflaging up here, but still there's a lot of variability, and there's some people down, down the end there who you know, are thinking, you know, sod it, I'm not going to be doing that. Uh, and, uh, and we'll talk more about that, that in a minute, actually. Um, so, given our discussion here about, about um, uh, sort of, uh, sex and gender differences, do autistic females camouflage more than autistic males? Uh, yes, they do, is, is what the evidence would suggest. Um, certainly we found that in our data, which is a questionnaire measure, but also other people, um, when they've tried to measure camouflaging in different ways, more observational <coughs> ways, have also tended to find higher uh, levels of camouflaging amongst um, uh, girls and women compared to boys and men uh, who are autistic. But another important sort of proviso here, uh, and I think you can see from these graphs here, that the top one is, is, is the guys and, and the bottom one is, is the women, uh, and again, scores more towards me to get high camouflaging. So you can see that the women are on average doing more camouflaging, but there's still plenty of camouflaging going on amongst uh, men. Uh, so, you know, I'm not here to say, that, oh, you know, this is just entirely, again, I'm not making the kind of men from Mars simplification. You know, this is something that we see uh, cross genders uh, amongst people. Okay, why do people camouflage? Um, so, again, I'm, I'm drawing on Laura Hull's work here and her qualitative study in this, this sort of fairly comprehensive kind of mapping she did of what is camouflaging, but also why do people camouflage and what are the consequences. And again, this is a rather a busy slide, of course, but. Do, do, I, I think the paper's quite engaging, so do, do read it in the leisure if you're interested. But Laura found two themes in the data about why uh, autistic people said they're camouflage you know, when, we, when we listened to them talking about this. One we call assimilation. So this was a kind of set of almost pragmatic, practical reasons for camouflaging. And then the other was called to know and be known. So this was about camouflaging in order to kind of almost extend a bridge to other people and to, and to make connections and to build relationships. So just to bring that to life in some quotes, this 27-year-old woman said, camouflaging helps us survive in school and college, and it's important to keep the jobs. Uh, this quote was one that really educated me, 
and, and, and sort of hit me between the eyes on this one. Why do you camouflage? I want to avoid the bullying, mostly. You know, so I think when we think about camouflaging, it, it, and, we, and we kind of really engage with that element of autistic experience, it, I, I think it's quite helpful to, to non-autistic people like myself to, to, for it to remind you the very real persecution and challenges that autistic people face, and to, sometimes, and to see camouflaging often as an attempt to manage those difficulties. Um, also, some more positive reasons that enable you to be about other people in a way that's relatively comfortable for me, but then so that's more about the, to know and be known. What are the consequences of camouflaging? Well, the, the thing that almost everybody told us, so this was somebody who's, who's 30 and is non-binary non in their gender, said, it's exhausting. I feel the need to seek solitude so I can be myself and not to have to think about how I'm perceived by others. That's a very common uh, account of, of camouflaging, and it's just really depleting uh, and, and you, know, you almost need to go away and just decompress after that experience. Um, also, you know, and this kind of loops back to, to where I started this, this discussion, really. So I went for so long about being diagnosed because I didn't know that I could pretend to be normal, one person told us. So, again, if we're thinking that autistic girls and women are more likely to be camouflaging, uh, and, you know, that, so that clearly must be one driver of the later or the underdiagnosis in, in this group. Interestingly, also, camouflaging seems to impact on access to other forms of care. Uh, you know, some people spoke about how they were so used to kind of putting on this persona where they were just really trying to almost second guess what the person talking to them wanted them to say and to kind of present that to them, that it got in the way of, for example, uh, open disclosures and GP appointments and, and, and other forms of access to, to health care. Uh, and we know that there are serious problems in, in, the, in the way that autistic people have on average. Uh, you know, not, obviously not everybody, but on average, uh, a high risk of, of, of not living as long uh, uh, as they should do. You know? So it's important, I think, impacting on that. And then I think, I think this is important as well. This is about identity. So you know, this is, this is a 22-year-old woman who's clearly spent a lot of her time feeling obliged to almost pretend to be somebody else. And she says, I feel that I've lost track of who I really am. And then my actual self is floating somewhere above me like a balloon. And that's qualitative work, but there's actually been a growing body of quantitative work, and numerical work, where this notion of camouflaging as something that is stressful, uh, challenging to, to, to sort of healthy identity formation, uh, it is growing. Because there is now a, a pretty strong evidence, I would say, for an association between camouflaging and mental health difficulties of autistic people. So, for example, Lucy Livingston and, and her colleagues found that high camouflaging is associated with high levels of anxiety. Um, uh, Amy Cage, who's done some really amazing work in this area, found that, again, higher people who camouflage in more situations or camouflage more compared to people who didn't, um, uh, also reported having higher levels of anxiety and stress. And you know, Sarah Cassidy's uh, really great work on, on, on suicidality in autism has also suggested a, a, a relationship a strong relationship between people who report more camouflaging and people who report more what they call suicidality. So um, this might be something I don't have time to go into this now, but there's you know, something to think about here, uh, about, you know, I, I started off researching camouflaging with a kind of neutral view about whether, in quote unquote, it was a good or a bad thing. I very much now have moved more towards the idea that, whilst I'm sure there are sometimes benefits of it, 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 I don't think it represents, um, in any simple sense, a, a good outcome for this people. Uh, and you know, it seems to me that um, you know, what is a social skills group uh, is not a camouflaging class. Uh, so you know, I think this sort of work is actually uh, going to hopefully for, force us to, to be more empathetic and understanding and, and to listen more carefully about what represents a, a, a good outcome for an autistic person. And I suspect a good outcome is not going to be uh, pretending to, to, to be a non-autistic person. Um, so, sorry so far, I said there, there are some important gender differences in, in how autism uh, presents. Um, and these likely contribute to the diagnosis of autistic girls and women. And this is the model I've sort of been pursuing so far. I've just sort of said that there are these biases, uh, and they kind of arise from the, the fact that some uh, autistic girls and women don't kind of fit the, the, the conventional definitions of, of autism. So 
So I've sort of really linked things to the kind of individual characteristics uh, of those girls uh, and women. But of course, that's not really the whole story. And I, what I want to argue very briefly is there's a bit of, a, of an important piece missing from that jigsaw. And it was something that was certainly illustrated in this study that we did a few years ago now, led by Sarah Barjela. There was a collaboration between Sarah, Robin Stewart and myself, where we interviewed some, some late-diagnosed autistic women, uh, partly to try and understand, in a way, why, why they'd been late-diagnosed, and why hadn't they been diagnosed uh, until adulthood. And we, we discovered lots of things in that paper, and again, I'm sort of plugging these papers shamelessly, that's also open access and uh, you know, free to read. But, but this is you know, an important point, which is, it's not just individual characteristics of autistic girls that can lead to timely diagnosis, or indeed to a late diagnosis, but also, of course, the knowledge and attitudes of those around them. Um, and so I just want to explore that idea uh, very briefly before I finish. So, of course, if, and, and, and how I'm going to explore it is thinking about you know, who are, if you like, the conduits to a diagnostic assessment for, for somebody who thinks they may be autistic or may be autistic. Well, there, there are many different people, but there are some like you know, your GP, you know, people often go to the GP, your, your teachers at school, uh, pediatricians, mental health services, and so on and so on. And you know, if there isn't the knowledge amongst those people, you know, that could be a really significant barrier to um, uh, autistic girls and women receiving, a, a, even getting their foot in the door, if you like, in a, in a diagnostic clinic. Um, and I'm actually going to focus uh, on a little bit of what we did, on, particularly on teachers, as a key gatekeeper to diagnostic assessment. Because what we find is that very often uh, autistic girls or uh, women who are diagnosed late often have presented to teachers with all sorts of difficulties, uh, but which have not been understood necessarily uh, as being potentially to do with autism. Um, and I just want to add, I'm definitely not here to slag off teachers uh, in any sense, or to run them down and say, oh, teachers don't understand you know, what autism looks like in, in girls and boys. Uh, quite the opposite. This is just where we started. I'm just making the broader point uh, that there are all sorts of important professionals in people's lives, and perhaps it's their attitude and understanding of, about autism, girls and women, that, that, it, that could be um, a good target for change if we wanted to promote early recognition diagnosis. So we ask these questions. Uh, are there barriers to teachers noticing which girls need autism assessment? And there could be one barrier, might be, perfectly understandably, do teachers lack knowledge of how autism looks in girls compared to boys? You know, would they, uh, again, you know, perfectly reasonably not be up to date on the sorts of findings I've been telling you about in the, in the gender difference literature? So that might be one barrier. And then the other could be almost a more simple one where, and again, we have some qualitative evidence for this, there could almost just be a gender stereotype. You know, this sort of idea that's out there that, you know, autism is a boy thing. Uh, you know, girls don't get autism today. You know, girls can't be autistic. Um, and, you know, I have heard stories of, 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 of women feeling that they were overlooked simply for that reason. So, you know, that's another potential barrier. There could just be a simple gender stereotype operating, which, again, would be fairly easy, I think, to correct. Um, so we did an experiment to sort of begin to explore this idea. Alana Whitlock and Kate Fulton are the students who kind of did, did all the hard work, and, and uh, Mae Fun Lai and Ms. Talakana and myself were sort of supervisors and, 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 uh, and saw the project. And basically what we did was we presented primary school teachers with written vignettes, so these short accounts, about 180 words, of um, uh, children in the classroom. Uh, and some of these vignettes were suggestive that those children were autistic. And then we had some distractive vignettes so that people didn't know they were actually doing a study on, on autism diagnosis to, to prevent bias. Um, and in the autism vignettes, each one would have five autism-specific pieces of information, you know, five little nuggets of information that would that would be consistent that the person was autistic, uh, plus some other information. And then we played around with those vignettes to test out those two ideas that we were um, talking about. So, you know, the, the, is there a barrier to do with a lack of knowledge about autistic girls? So we had one vignette that was, so it's a terrible term, girl typical autism. I just, I'm trying not to use the word female autism phenotype, but I hope you know what I mean, which is a sort of a presentation that would fit with uh, the literature on, um, uh, on autistic girls. Um, so that described a kind of a, 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 a girl who would perhaps be uh, emblematic of, of, of that sort of tip of that type of presentation of autism, and then uh, a, a more sort of traditional uh, quote unquote boy typical autism. And so we, we gave people both of those vignettes and we balanced them really carefully 
in all sorts of other ways, like in terms of the number of autistic characteristics that were presented, or the amount of difficulties that the child was having, or the amount of strengths that they had. So that we tried to make it that the only difference between those vignettes was that one described the more girl uh, typical uh, sort of presentation, and the other the more boy typical. And we also did another type of manipulation to test whether there are gender stereotypes at, uh, at play. So here, we would give pe some people randomly, um, so we had the same vignette, and we would give half randomly, that vignette would be about Jack, and half, it would just be about Chloe. So the only difference between those two vignettes, they were identical, except that one was about a boy, and one was about a girl. And then when we gave people these vignettes, we said, how likely is it that this child has autism? And again, you know, it's not has autism, it's not necessarily a phrase I would like to use, but in terms of communicating with hundreds of teachers, that, that was, it, it was deemed to be more understandable than is autistic in, in this context. So we, we recruited via the internet 289 primary school education staff who were mostly current teachers, uh, others being trainee teachers, people not currently practicing, other education staff, 95% female which I, th I think is even slightly more than the, the, than the actual proportion of females in, in primary school teaching, but not much more, actually. Uh, and, they, and you can see there the age range. So what do we find? So was there evidence of less recognition of autism um, as, as it's more likely to present in girls? So this is the, the kind of the girl typical versus the boy typical in the year. And the answer is yes. So the, the, the boy typical presentation was on average given a 70% likelihood that this child was autistic. Um, and the carefully matched girl typical presentation was given a 60% likelihood by the teachers. Yeah. And then I find this finding even more telling in a way. So this is the one where we simply changed the name and gender of the child. And what we found was that if the child was called Jack, there was an average of 68% likelihood. Uh, and if the child was called Chloe, uh, there was a 62% likelihood. So there may well be, uh, you know, amongst... Uh, primary school teachers and possibly also other uh, you know, key gatekeepers for assessment, these sort of gaps in knowledge that we need to do much more to, to fill, uh, and also a sort of, that includes almost a sort of assumption that, that autism is really a kind of a boy thing. And um, I see this as just the beginning, because it seems to me that this is really an area where we could begin to make a difference. And to me, I'd be interested in a lot of people's thoughts here, but to me, one group that are really crucial here are GPs. You know, I think very often people's journey towards autism assessment could begin with going to see the GP, and so we need, and I think there's huge variability in knowledge and, and understanding amongst GPs. Um, and, and also, I think, mental health presentations, because in particular, you know, we certainly know, for example, that eating disorder services are full of undiagnosed uh, autistic women, um, and also we've done a study in, in OCD services as well. You know, so I think we need also... gender and autism, um, it, we, we just have to make sure that we share that beyond people who are kind of autism specialists or have a particular interest in autism, because we can only really make that count if, that's, if it's distributed much more widely among professionals such as teachers, GPs, and, and, and more general mental health practitioners. So in conclusion, uh, autistic girls and women continue to fly under the diagnostic radar, uh, and I, I would argue often with really negative consequences for, for their lives. This reflects the fact that gender is how autism presents, but also it reflects a lack of knowledge about autistic young women by key professionals, many of whom are not working in specialist autism services. And to address the gender bias and diagnosis, we need to continue to try and better understand the experiences and characteristics of autistic girls and women. And it's, you know, it's projects like this, and conferences like this, that, that very much uh, you know, move that forward. Uh, but we also need to share that knowledge widely and find ways to really engage a wide range of people in, in the sorts of conversations that we're, that we're having at, at this conference. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you very much indeed, well, that was really, really interesting. Um, and uh, what we'll do is we're going to move on to the second presentation, but then if we've got a few minutes at the end, we can take some questions, or well, as said, obviously you'll be around over the break as well, so if people have specific questions, they can um, go and speak to, to us. So um, I'd like to introduce now our, our second speaker. 
um, so Katrina and Dr. Katrina Stewart. Um, and Katrina, I just get my, my teeth back in. Um, Katrina is the, the founder of the what we call the of SWAN, which is the Scottish Women Autism Network, um, which um, since it was 2012, is that correct? Um, and, and it's been providing kind of regular peer support um, uh, groups across Scotland for, for, for autistic um, women, um, including young young kids as well, or young adolescents, like yeah, 15 to 17. young women's groups as well, which is young swans groups, which is uh, 15 to 17. Mm -hmm. and, and you're going to um, talk to us this morning, yes. no, not quite the afternoon yet, um, uh, about kind of a shared vision of inclusion um, and issues around gender identity and peer support. Thank you very much. Yes, good morning. Um, so we are running a bit late, I'm aware of that, and uh, I also uh, practised my talk last night and it came out at I'm normally quite well organised, it came out about 45 minutes. So I'm going to have to really run through this presentation and there's going to be some slides I'm not going to comment on, I'm just going to kind of ignore them. So if you're a bit confused as to why I'm doing that, it's because I'm really trying to save you some time so you actually do get your tea break. <laughs> Um, so I'm trying, trying to be kind to not confusing. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak this morning. I actually genuinely feel really honoured to have been given this opportunity to talk. Um, to take part in this really, really interesting uh, event. So that, that's just a snippet. You know to read it, that's just a wee snippet from our uh, Swans Conditions of Engagement, which our group facilitators are all asked to sign and our trustees are also asked to sign it. And then, uh, this one here. Yep, yep. Um, I'm going to go that one. Um, that's another section from our conditions of engagement. It talks to us a wee bit about uh, what Swan's about. Um, one of the things I'd like to talk about this morning is uh, can you just ask um, how many of you have heard, heard of the term intersectionality? Yeah, most of you. Um, that's great. So, do, do most of you, the same number of people actually kind of know where it comes from and who coined it and what it's about? It's all right, I'm not going to get you to stand up and give a speech about it and um, about your answer, but can we just get a sense? So, a few of you, but quite a lot fewer. Um, okay, so Kimberly Crenshaw um, is an American uh, academic who coined the term intersectionality. She coined the term intersectionality in response to uh, a debate um, that was going on within the fe feminism, um, you, you know, I'm going to show my age here, I actually was involved in uh, the latter stages of second wave feminism and there was a lot of debate about what feminism really represented. Was female oppression down to class, was it down to patriarchy, was it a mixture of the two? Um, there were accusations that uh, it was mostly you know, the germane views of, of the of the movement were really white middle class females who wanted the same levels of privilege as their male counterparts, and that black women, women of colour, disabled women, poor women were actually not really part of that same conversation. So Kimberly Crenshaw came up with the term intersectionality to describe the ways in which different strands of power or disempowerment can come together in any particular one individual. So Kimberly was talking in Edinburgh a few weeks ago, why did I not know about this? I didn't. Um, but a friend of mine, who surprisingly is still a friend, although she did know about it and didn't tell me, um, <laughs> got to go and see her speak at Edinburgh University. Um, and apparently there was a 400 long waiting list, so I think it was probably most of the academics who got to go. And at the end of her conversation, at the end of her presentation, Kimberly was asked, how many of you know what TERFs stands for? Okay, trans exclusionary radical feminists, part of the whole trans uh, feminist part of that whole debate about gender identity. And she was asked at the end of her, her talk what she felt about TERFs being given a platform in universities. And the expectation was she would say, well, of course they shouldn't be given a platform. And what she actually said was she asked a question. And her question was, what vision of solidarity is at play here? I'm just going to leave that with you as a question. What vision of solidarity is at play here? I think another question I would always ask where there is discord uh, between, uh, within social groups, particularly social groups who are working for social inclusion, who are part of social movement. I think the other question I would ask where there is discord is what needs are being expressed? 
what needs are actually not being met here. So to move, to move on to autism, gender and intersectionality. Okay, not there yet. Um, so autism and gender is not just two threads. It's like a myriad of multicoloured, you know, threads, a bit, a bit like your, your project, um, you know, the, all coming together. So you've got autism, autistic people are defined as uh, within a kind of disability model, uh, they're discriminated against, they're marginalised, they, we, are stigmatised, we're oppressed. Females in society experience discrimination, marginalisation. Autistic females are marginalised even within the autism world as well as actually just explained really well. So we've been excluded from research. Um, we're not included, we're still not included in any strategy discussions that I'm aware of. Um, we've not been included in any specific service provision up until very recently and even now. There are no specific autism services needed by autistic females within education, as well again as just really clearly illustrating. Um, mental health services, maternity services, health services, social services. There are issues around areas of multiple deprivation and socioeconomic status. I think autism is just as much a class issue as almost anything else is. Um, there are racial and cultural issues in terms of the black and uh, ethnic minority populations. There's a lack of accommodation for the voices of those less able to communicate vocally. And I really love this project because it's about offering uh, autistic girls alternative means of creative expression. And I just think that is so important um, for, for people who may have difficulty actually you know, finding, finding words to describe how they feel and then actually explain that to other people. That can be a massive challenge, but to be able to use the expressive arts to do that is just a fantastic resource. So then there is a thread of lack of conformity to gender stereotyping which is experienced and described by so many uh, women with the impact on their social inclusion, their sense of self-identity and the mental health that all these things have. So all these intersectionalities have come together to make historically and now autistic women invisible not just within society but to themselves, which again will alluded to is that sense of um, not really knowing who you are, if you're pretending to be something else all the time, and it is, it is a survival strategy, but then you're also in self-denial, you, you, you're not paying attention to who you really are and what your own needs are. So there are no role models, the, the duck uh, illustrated that, the idea of having no role models, if you can't see yourself, how do you know who you, who you are, or who, how do you aspire to see yourself as the future? So. So I was set up in 2012 in response to my PhD research study, which is a long time ago now. Um, key driver, facilitation of authentic voices of autistic girls with anxiety. I'm not going to dwell on any of this. I've presented on this quite a few times anyway. And that, that was, it was a thematic analysis, and that was the core theme that I came up with about this, where can we be what we are in relation to a definition of home as being where we can be what we are. And the girls in my study felt uncomfortable everywhere. So, and on the back of that, because we've been doing what we've been doing, we provide peer support, we run an online forum, we run uh, meetups around Scotland, um, we know, we can see the benefits of it, we understand the power of uh, autistic women meeting each other and just talking about their, their lives and having a laugh and all the rest of it, but we really know that we need to evidence this in some way. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that because we don't need to any time as the lessons. Um, so the Under Our Wing Peer Mentoring Project was uh, a response to the glaring gaps identified in education and pastoral care of young autistic children <coughs> with a lifelong impact on individuals that have to navigate their way into adulthood in a world that doesn't understand and accommodate them, often hampered by poor mental health, a poor sense of self-identity and without the necessary tools for positive self-care. Um, it's the, why peer, peer mentoring? Because it's the game changer potentially. On the need to the power of peer support for mental health and wellbeing. So the task was to design, deliver, and evaluate a route to peer mentoring for autistic girls and women. Um, we had to design it, we had to do all the processes and protocols. We got the funding from the Scottish Government. 
and the Remedies Partnership with Scottish Autism, but it was totally autistic led. I managed it. We employed an autistic part time coordinator to do the, to actually kind of deliver it, if you like. Um, we, ha we did have non autistic trainers, but Ronnie and I, the other autistic part of the management team, and I actually delivered aut training on autism to the participants because they may well have a diagnosis or they may well self identify, but it doesn't actually know, mean that they are just. Mm. The access to their information about autism they're likely to have had will not necessarily be the kind of information that is going to empower them or to inform them really about how to take their lives forward in a sort of positive way with self-esteem, if that makes sense. So we, we, we do our own training. Um, we modelled it very much as co-production, so it was very much about, yes, we had a, a really kind of a rich, rich programme of a training and experiential learning, but we asked the participants to see this as their project, that this is a pilot, we've never done this before, we wanted them to take responsibility for the, you know, having input into it, what do you like about it, what do you not like about it. We, it was really interesting because it made some fascinating discussions, particularly around things like what do you mean by networking for autistic people, that, that's an interesting one. And Diana Blesser, who is very, very experienced in working with groups of women worldwide in all sorts of contexts, um, doesn't know about autism, so we commented each other. Um, she, she learned a lot. Um, she was absolutely, you know, just stunned and delighted. Everyone who has worked with us in this project has just gone, we love this, we want to do more of this. They're just blown away by, by the impact, really, um, of what's going on. And we had some fabulous input from Scottish Forestry, we had some outdoor sessions as well. Um, so there we are on our way day, courtesy of, of uh, Scottish Forestry. Key outcomes, these were, key, these were general outcomes that we're looking for. So it's not about we want people to go from any particular point to another set point, this is about personal development, around the of identity, um, confidence, citizenship. Demographics were very broad and varied. They knew from like they're young to old like me. Um, yeah. It is it's it, it's been externally evaluated, that is still undergoing, we're still waiting for the report, we're looking forward to that immensely. But participants have already reported a greater sense of identity, so it's a better sense of relational experiences actually in community, through self-confidence, skill growth, friendships form. Um, so we also have some creative parts of this. So this was actually on the away day where we one of the participants had offered a kind of craft project for us to do, so we did that and it's long roll of paper and everyone kind of drew on it um, or wrote on it or did whatever they wanted with it. And then the, the, that in the middle is an extra day that Ronnie and I inserted into the programme which was run by us because the women were saying they wanted more just autistic led discussion. So we, we inserted another day where we had a conundrum circle so that they could talk about some of the specific concerns they might have about their mentoring because this is, this is the point they've been matched with their mentees. Um, so. And these are some of the resources that the women shared with each other. We set up our own little Facebook forum just for the, just for the mentors. I love that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's all, it was very, people were sharing stuff with each other. Um, we had an arts workshop at a place called Projectability as well. We also had an Apple, local Apple Store ban, uh, IT workshops for the mentees. Um, and this is for the mentors and the, and the mentees. So these are the bags that we printed during that doing that project, doing that day. So, so I want to go back to the gender identity issues. Um, and I want to talk a wee bit about myself. Um, because I'm an old person. <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah, so I've been around for quite a long time. So when I was young, I was only involved in second wave feminism. Um, I explored my sexuality, I had some serious issues around gender identity and I, I think it's fair to actually tell you this, share this with you, that I have not yet, I mean I've been running Swan for seven years, I have yet to meet a woman in Swan, no matter how they, um, 
And that's a matter of how they present to the world who have not had serious questionings of their own gender identity, at sometimes in their lives or throughout their lives. I mean, I knew I did it. I'll share some very personal stuff with you, but I think this is a good form to do that in. Um, I never wanted to be a man, but I certainly went through phases where I thought that I must be in the, the wrong sex body. Um, I, I was anorexic, um, I suffered mental health issues, I was very confused, um, and I was very sad. Now, I did go to art school, um, although that actually probably wasn't the best place for me, but I mean, believe it or not, right in the middle of the punk era, given my age, right? I was still struggling to get mixed media, photography, or performance art accepted within Glasses School of Art. But I did find feminism, and it gave me a place to be. It gave me a way, a means of expressing my anger. It gave me language uh, to, to express my anger. And instead of focusing my gaze on my own sense of displacement in my embodied and gendered self, I found a community of people, women, gay men, trans people who were all as angry as the, the world of the was, who were challenging the social external representations of gender with which we were being presented. Um, I was worried about words to say this, but I, st I do still have difficulties in this area. I mean, I'm a very high testosterone woman with an exceptionally high IQ. Um, how many men do you think in this culture uh, know what to do with me? <laughs> <laughs> Some have tried. <laughs> All have failed. Sorry, guys, not your fault. I still love you. Well, sometimes it's your fault. But anyway, um, <laughs> so feminism, feminism allows. Allowing me now, I, this is a very difficult thing to say because I don't want it to be misinterpreted. I suppose what now might be termed my gender fluid self to assume a viable, a tolerable identity, being a woman always is a form of masking. And I, I've come over the last few years to think about that in terms of gender identity. I think for a lot of women it is still a form of masking. Um, but for, for me, my survival strategy was to uh, adopt the identity as a feminist, a woman, a feminist, where I adhere to form of feminism that was about people's rights to make informed and supported choices, whatever those were. So to be supported in being themselves, not what other expect, others expected of us then. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm almost <laughs> I think I'm almost at the end. So yeah. So for me that a core need being expressed in so many ways by so many autistic people, women, is the need to be to be heard, to be seen, to be witnessed, just to be acknowledged. Um, that core lack of self-identity that, 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 that Will has talked about, you know, that, that is, is at the root of um, so much that is the depression, that the vulnerability that a lot of females I think are particularly vulnerable to being exploited, uh, being abused, maybe in different ways to boys actually. You know, I wonder whether boys end up more on the criminal justice system and girls maybe get abused and exploited in other ways. Um, I mean, bullying is bullying, but there's still gendered kind of, you know, uh, forms of it. And it, it affects the whole life trajectory, the choices we make, the directions we go in. So, in the last Women's Conference 2016, there was a group of us, we were asked, what does success look like for an autistic adult, autistic woman? And that, I think we all basically came up with a very similar kind of idea in mean, our own ways with very different backgrounds, very different people. There was Robin, there was Sarah, there was the, you know, um, but we all came up with very similar answers. And for me, the, the, the terms I used was leading an, an authentic life, being able to lead an authentic life, being able to tell an authentic narrative of my, of my life. Um, so I was asked um, at a recent event, how do autistic women develop a sense of identity? And my answer is that we talk to each other authentically about our lives, our lived experiences. We listen without prejudice or judgment, we respect each other's perspectives and we honour the shared struggles as well as our achievements and celebrate our successes. And I know I've got a few slides left, but I don't. Oh, no, that's what happened. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> um, so I think in order to make progress, we actually, we all need each other. Autistics, all genders, all allies, and I'd like to add a further question. This is a question I really want to leave you with. This is the thing that, I, to me, is actually the root of this whole event. And um, it's how... I forgot what the question What shared vision of an inclusive future can we build together?